within Indiana's lakes, ponds, rivers, woods, and even cemeteries are stories of monsters, unexplained creatures that have terrified the citizens of Indiana, often leaving disturbing evidence that they were there and may return without warning. More than just folklore, these terrifying experiences told by credible eyewitnesses have made local and national newspapers. While most people are familiar with Bigfoot, there are many other beasts that call Indiana home. If you travel west of Lafayette, Indiana, to the small town of Oxford, you'll find the Oxford West Cemetery. It's fairly typical of many small town Indiana cemeteries, except for what looks like a fortress in the distance. This is a large mausoleum built to safely house the bodies of the dead for eternity. It would not be unusual in the big city, but it is here in a country graveyard. And the reason it was built is the stuff of legends. In September 1889, an enormous snake was spotted in this graveyard by at least a dozen witnesses. According to the Logansport Journal, it was at least 15 feet long and as wide as a stovepipe, big enough to swallow a person. Some said it had horns and eyes that glowed, but more terrifying, they found holes all over the cemetery, underneath the graves of loved ones. In a day when caskets were made of wood and easily disintegrated, the beast was eating the bodies of the dead. It was then that this castle of a mausoleum was built to protect the dearly departed from being the lunch of what would be called the Ghoul Snake of Oxford West Cemetery. The mausoleum is incredibly impressive and looks like it would resist hurricane force winds or the devious attempts to get in by a monster snake. But is there any proof? You'll find circular bear spots that are probably naturally occurring. But you'll also find holes, a lot of them, and they are all about 15 inches across, the size of an old stovepipe. In some places, the ground is raised in long lines, as if something is burrowing. Is it just a large mole? Or a large snake still searching for bodies? No one has seen the ghoul snake in a long time. Since 1889 and the construction of the mausoleum, Burials have also had concrete vaults and locked caskets made of steel, providing ultra-safe places for eternal rest, and a strong deterrent against a monster snake with a huge appetite. All the same, I won't be here at dark. Northeast of Logansport is the town of Rochester and Lake Manitow. The lake covers 775 acres, is 3 miles long by 2 miles wide, and is up to 65 feet deep. But the Potawatomi word, Manitou, has a special meaning. Loosely translated, it means Devil's Lake, for they believed it was home 
to a lake monster. They'd seen a giant serpent-like creature appear in the water, swimming with a large wake behind it. They called the fearsome creature Meshekinavek. But by all accounts, it resembled later reports of the Loch Ness Monster. It killed two of their warriors in a single day, leaving them with a perpetual fear of this place. They warned white settlers, but the stories were dismissed as just Indian folklore, but not for long. Men surveying the lake reported seeing a creature over 30 feet long and with the head of a horse. Then John Lindsay, a local blacksmith, spotted what he described as a snake-like creature at least 60 feet long with a head 3 feet in diameter that looked like a horse. And, just like sightings of Bigfoot, and other lake monsters today, everyone made fun of him, saying he'd been drinking. But it was not the last sighting, by far. In 1838, three fishermen spotted the lake monster, and it was reported in the Logansport Telegraph newspaper. They said it had a head like a cow, a body like a snake, and was maybe 60 feet long. The story went nationwide, and fishermen from the east coast came with large nets to try and capture whatever it was, but left empty-handed. Freakishly large fish were caught in the Devil's Lake, some over 200 pounds, but none of them resembled a serpent with a cow or horse's head, and catching them did not stop sightings of the Lake Manitou Monster. In 1969, Carol Utter and her son were out on the lake when something surfaced. It was larger than her 14-foot fishing boat, and she could not see the entire length of the creature. And many fishermen since then have reported something very similar. Some say the lake has an eerie quality that's difficult to explain. Local residents have reported a deep, booming noise from the lake and wonder if it's the Manitou monster. It's been almost 200 years since the first sighting, and yet the mystery has never been solved. Northwest of Fort Wayne, Indiana, is the town of Cherubusco. With great pride, the town calls itself Turtle Town, USA, and for a very strange reason. In 1898, Oscar Folk lived on a farm just outside of town. One day, he looked out on his seven-acre lake and spotted a monster snapping turtle, five feet wide, six feet long, and weighing up to 1,500 pounds. It was gigantic and looked like a dinosaur. The largest alligator snapping turtle on record was 35 inches long and weighed nearly 250 pounds. But given how ferocious even normal-sized snapping turtles are, one that's six feet long could be a man-eater. But when Oscar told people about the dinosaur in his lake, no one believed him. Fast forward to July of 1948. Two friends, Charlie Wilson and Aura Blue, were out on the same lake and saw the monster with their own eyes. And no one believed them either. But everything changed after Minister Orville Reese and the lake's new owner, Gail Harris, saw the monster turtle, and they told everyone. For starters, no one's telling the minister that he's a liar or has been drinking. 
But they did tell Gail Harris that if there was a monster, prove it. And that's just what he did. Right off the bat, Gail made an elaborate trap and actually caught the lake monster on day one. But it was way too strong and busted its way out. This ignited an obsession within Gale. He attached an underwater periscope and light to the boat so he could drive across and look for the monster. Newspapers and radio programs published the stories from coast to coast. Over 5,000 people came to the tiny town and the phone rang nonstop. The monster was called the Beast of Busco, but also Oscar, in honor of Oscar Folk, the man that had first seen the massive turtle in 1898. Curious people came to the lake to help in the search, but Oscar eluded them as well. Gail even brought a female turtle as a lure, but Oscar was not in a romantic mood. An airplane flew overhead to try and spot him, but Oscar was a no-show. Gail acquired diving equipment and enlisted a friend to jump in the water to take a look. But the diving helmet filled with water and he nearly drowned. General Electric, having read the news of the monster turtle, offered a new tactic, high voltage. They sent 2,500 volts into the lake to make Oscar surface and maybe stun him a little. The lake was electrified and the huge turtle came up to the surface briefly but quickly swam away. In the end, all it did was kill a bunch of fish and frogs. Gil was starting to look pretty silly and was losing face with the people of Churubusco and all the out-of-towners that came to see a monster. In a last desperate move, Gail decided to drain the lake. Gail rigged his tractor to be a pump and started pumping all the water out of the lake. He used over 2,000 gallons of fuel to prove he wasn't crazy and there really was a lake monster. He reduced the size of the lake from seven acres to just one, but Oscar did not show up. The remaining pond was dredged with a crane, but Oscar was too clever to be caught. For all they knew, Oscar might have swam through an underground tunnel to another pond or lake. These subterranean waterways are known to exist in Whitley County. Gail had spent a small fortune trying to prove a point and was so busy with hunting a monster that he didn't have time to be a farmer. The bills mounted up. He ended up selling the farm and lake and working for General Electric. Since 1948, interest in the Beast of Busco has remained high, but there has never been as large of a search as that made by Gail Harris. Oscar now has his own statue at the community park. And each July, the town hosts a Turtle Days festival, the highlight being a turtle race. Some have speculated that the Beast of Busco was once the pet of Miami Chief Little Turtle that was born here in Whitley County, and that we should let the old turtle just live its life in peace. Many people claim that they've seen the Beast of Busco, while others say he must have died by now. But given that some turtles can live between 200 and even 300 years, I wouldn't put my toes in the water just yet. It may surprise you that Indiana has an area west of Evansville that closely resembles the Florida Everglades, including bald cypress. 
But here's something else that might surprise you. For over 100 years, there have been alligator sightings in Indiana up to the present day. In 1908, a farmer spotted an alligator swimming in his pond in Decker Township. People later saw it swimming in the Wabash River. It was never captured. In 1911, one was spotted and captured near Evansville, but it was only two feet long, a baby. And perhaps that's what scared people more that big alligators were having lots and lots of babies. In 1946, at Vincennes, Indiana, two hunters spotted and killed a sizable alligator at Mariah Creek. Alligators also showed up in the city. In 1959, an 18-inch alligator was found swimming in Fall Creek in Indianapolis. Small and alone is manageable, but in 2006, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources confirmed that a pair of alligators were swimming together in the White River, and it doesn't stop there. In 2018, an alligator was spotted in a pond at Plymouth, Indiana, and captured. In 2021, there were two more incidences. In July, seven miles northwest of Columbia City, an alligator was killed at Whitley Lake. It was over five feet long. Just a month later, in August, a woman walking her dog in Indianapolis was startled when a five foot long alligator snapped at her dog. The question is, where are all these alligators coming from? Unlike Florida, Indiana gets pretty inhospitable for cold-blooded alligators. While snakes, lizards, and turtles go underground during the winter, alligators would find it difficult to impossible to do the same. But there is another solid theory about how alligators got to Indiana over 100 years ago and why they are still being spotted today. In the late 1800s, rail lines to Florida brought in many tourists, and alligators were fully exploited for their exotic nature. You could get your picture taken with a stuffed alligator, or go on an exciting alligator hunt. At Jacksonville alone, there were 12 alligator dealers. They sold alligator teeth taxidermied alligator heads and full bodies for conversation pieces. But the main draw, you could buy a pet baby alligator. In 1890 alone, over 8,000 baby alligators were bought by Florida tourists, and many of these made it back to Indiana. That coincides with when people started seeing alligators in Indiana lakes ponds and rivers. Selling baby alligators was still perfectly legal in the 1950s. While the alligator pet stores are now gone, anyone with a net can scoop up a baby alligator from Florida and take it home. Baby alligators are cute when they're tiny and don't eat very much. Not so much when they're five feet long and can eat your dog. During the pet alligator craze, zoos were overwhelmed by people offering large, aggressive alligators that they couldn't handle anymore. Zoos had to turn people away, saying, we have all the alligators that we can handle. So having no alternative, these pets were released into Indiana lakes, ponds, and rivers with zero regard for public safety. And unfortunately, this still happens today. It's probably too cold for any alligator to survive an Indiana winter. But if you're swimming in any of Indiana's lakes, ponds, or rivers in warm weather, just know you may not be swimming 
alone. When it comes to monster stories, perhaps the most terrifying ones are where the monster patiently and quietly waits in the dark, methodically hunting their victims down, only attacking when it's too late. For nearly 150 years, people in Indiana have told stories of large cats, and in particular, a black panther, a jet black monstrous cat big enough to take down deer, large pigs, and even cows. One that lurks in the woods, waiting to strike at night. To this day, people see them on a dark road. At the edge of their farm, as dark silhouettes on the horizon. Or they hear unusual things in the woods at night before livestock are viciously killed and taken away. But sometimes, they're seen prowling small town streets early of a morning by a paper boy or someone headed to work. Many dismiss the sightings as house cats with exaggerated size until the farm animals are attacked in ways so savage that it cannot be overlooked. People form search parties with shotguns and high-powered rifles, but the big cat hears them and easily slips away. Most usually, the panther is never seen again, and sometimes it returns. But the terror of never knowing has people lock up all their animals and have loaded weapons ready by the door. Conservation officers say there is no such thing as black panthers, mountain lions, or any other large cats in the state of Indiana. But that's not what people have been saying for generations. As early as 1877, the New York Times printed a story from Rising Sun in which a young couple were attacked by a monster-sized cat. The beast left a paw print that was six inches across. Sightings and savage livestock attacks followed in 1890 at Scottsburg, 1894 at Uniondale, and 1899 at Dresser. But the panther managed to escape every time. That changed in 1946 at Lebanon. A black panther terrorized farms across the community killing pigs, lambs, and calves in the night. But two men tracked the monster into the woods and up a tree. They shot the beast with a 30-30 rifle, and it fell into the creek. It made no struggle and floated away lifeless. The men were confident that everyone had seen the last of Indiana's Black Panther, but they were wrong. Numerous livestock attacks continued in 1947, but in 1948, the beast started leaving a new hideous calling card. At Fountain City, farmers found their pigs dead, but the panther ate only their hearts and livers, leaving the rest of the carcass behind. The black panther was seen in southwest Indianapolis in 1949, near Lafayette in 1956, in Pike County in 1957, leaving a trail of mutilated animals wherever it went. In 1958, it killed 35 chickens at just one farm near Paradise. People were either firm believers in a black panther or assumed others were misidentifying coyotes in the dark. But in 1961, a minister at Lilydale saw and shot at the beast. Without a doubt, he said it was all black, five feet long, and had a 30-inch tail. Reverend David Brown 
had been a missionary to Africa and had seen big cats there and said it looked exactly like a black leopard. And it got away. There have been sightings in Perry County in 1978, in Michigan City in 1985, where the panther was seen with a dead domestic cat in its mouth. Numerous Black Panther reports were filed at South Bend in 2003, leading many to think that it had little to no fear of people with a population that large. By February 2004, one was seen at the southern tip of the state at Cliffy Falls State Park by a park employee. As the park is heavily visited by tourists, no good could come from it being there. A black panther was later seen in Albion that same month, just 18 miles away. One was seen at Bloomington in 2005, and in that same year, Elkhart. By 2006, it had slaughtered six pigs at Whitehall. And in 2008, a black panther was seen in Floyd County, northwest of New Albany, taking down a deer. For an animal that doesn't exist, it sure is seen a lot, and has killed countless animals in savage ways. To this day, Indiana Black Panther reports keep coming in, faster than people can say there is no such thing. The only question is, when you walk into the woods, what do you believe? The monster stories told so far are certainly not the only ones in Indiana. Native Americans that inhabited what's now Anderson and Mound State Park claimed that tiny, cantankerous people named Pukwudgies roamed the forest. Living in this ancient, sacred area, they have poison arrows, magical powers, can disappear at will and are not to be trifled with. It seems a bit far-fetched. But people in modern times, as late as the 1990s, claim to have seen them. Witnesses have said that they think they see small children in the woods, but as they get closer, they have troll-like faces. Since the late 1600s, at Vincennes, there has been a long-standing legend of werewolves with sightings at the old French and Indian cemetery on a full moon. But unlike the Hollywood version, they have actually helped people. One saved a man from drowning, and another nursed a sickly man back to health. If you search county archives across the state, you'll find numerous tales of werewolves and dogmen. In 1891, people at Vivi reported seeing two strange creatures that were half human and half lizard and laying along the bank of the Ohio River. They called them mud mermaids. But unlike the little mermaid you're familiar with, they were extremely hideous with dog-like ears. In 1955, a woman that was tubing down the Ohio River near Evansville was grabbed by what she described as a river monster that had a green hand and claws. It pulled her under the water twice before she could get away. After the attack, she had a bloodied leg that retained a green stain for several days. And all over Indiana, are tales of Bigfoot, with most occurring in and around the Hoosier National Forest. All of these tales make great campfire stories, with some very difficult to tell fact from fiction. But if one thing is for sure, there is no end to the imagination, nor the monster stories of Indiana.